Welcome to my presentation. I hope you all doing well. Um, my name is Walter Legerstee and I want to tell you ab something about the characterization of porous silicon as an anode material. And for that I used atomic force microscopy and positron annulation spectroscopy. So, uh, I will tell you something about porous silicon, about atomic force microscopy on porous silicon shortly. Then I go to positron annihilation analysis techniques and uh, I explain you how we use that for porous silicon anodes. And then I give you some conclusions about our findings. First of all, silicon is a very interesting material as an anode ma uh, material. It has a uh, theoretical capacity of 10 times higher than the normally used graphite anode. So that makes it very interesting. Silicon is a poor electron uh, conductive material, but the most important drawback is the expansion. It expands up to 400% when it is alloyed by, uh, with lithium. So one of the possible solutions is por use of porous silicon, because the pores can, uh, fill, uh, can absorb uh, uh, the expansion. Here you see this in this drawing. A silicon particle from normal silicon will expand and because of this large volume you get cracking and fracture. But when you have a porous silicon particle, the expansion will be absorbed by the micropores. For this study we used eMaggi from the company eMaggi and that's a porous silicon that has a half product in the form of a wafer or flake. And that is ideal for our purpose because we use AFM and for AFM we need a flat surface. So a kind of wafer or flake is ideal for AFM uh, investigations. When, we, uh, we, when you crush these, these, these wafer or flakes, uh, you can prepare a, um, an anode material uh, combining with a carbon black and binder. And uh, we made anodes uh, of uh, about 80% of porous silicon. Here you see these, uh, a, a, a same picture of this uh, anode material. For our positron measurements, we made half cells against lithium. And we had a, a standard procedure of charging our samples. First of all, we start this procedure by two cycles of formatting. And then we do 10 cycles of charging, one cycle at 0.1 C again, and then at the end we bring all, we try to extract all the lithium to, uh, by bringing the sample to 1 volt against lithium lithium uh, by this procedure. You see this by these steps. So this is uh, charging against lithium and then rest and charging the rest and so on till we reach almost a value of 1 volt. Okay, when we uh, did uh, atomic force microscopy on the sample, we had the following results. We did a topo scan of the pristine material and you see clearly that there are holes in the material. These pores are clearly visible in this scan. During uh, this uh, experiment, we were able to lithiate the sample during this experiment and after this lithiation, we had this scan. This scan is uh, the lithiation is uh, above 2000 milliampers per gram, and you see clearly that all the pores are closed and the material is totally uh, is changed uh, in, on surface. We did also a topo scan and a spreading resistance scan with the pristine material. The pre spreading resistance is we put a voltage between the sample and the probe and we measure the, the current and then we can see the conductivity of the sample um, on, on, this, uh, on this surface. And you can clearly see, see that when we change the voltage for uh, 1 volt, 2 volt and 3 volts, you see clearly that the uh, conductivity around the pores is better than, not, uh, than in, the, in the bulk. So that's an interesting finding. Now I want to tell you something about positron annihilation techniques. First of all, I want to tell you about the principle for positron annihilation. For positron annihilation, you need a positron source, and the positron source 
we uh, moderate the positrons that coming out and then we can accelerate these positrons and that's important because by acceleration we can make a depth scan to change energy to make an energy selection we can uh, change the depth because positrons annihilate uh, with electrons when they are in thermal position thermalization takes time and also energy loss. So when you shoot a positron with a certain energy in the material, it will lose its energy until it's thermal, and then it will find an electron somewhere in the material and annihilate with that. This annihilation gives two gammas of 511 keV, and these gammas have some information because this gamma, the 511 keV, there is a little difference from this 511 keV and that difference that gives us information about the electron that is catched by trapping by, uh, by this positron. And when we plot this energy distribution of this uh, photon, of this gamma, we will see this Gaussian plot. And this Gaussian plot gives us information because uh, we can define, define parameters of this Gaussian plot. The middle part of the Gaussian plot we call the S parameter and that is related to valence electrons and sensitive to open volume defects. The wings we define as the W parameter related to core electrons and sensitive to chemical surrounding. Important is that you, uh, you uh, understand that S and W are um, uh, are connected to each other. When S is smaller, W will be changing also. So that's an important thing. For our measurement, we use the Doppler, Doppler broadening spectroscopy, and that means we, uh, we, we measure the differences in energy and making the analysis of the 511 plus or minus energy and, uh, shift. This is our setup um, for the Doppler broadening spectroscopy measurements. Here you see a pulse measurement on por uh, porous silicon anodes. First of all, we have the S parameter. You see here a pristine measurement, a measurement of the pristine material with a certain S parameter. And the S parameter is changing when we change the cycling and the amount of uh, capacity. With a capacity of 1000, we have this kind of behavior of the positrons in depth we have a certain S parameter and um, with 3000 we have a much higher S parameter in the bulk. We can plot that, we have a, a, a plotting uh, program for that, that is accepted plot, plotting program all over the world. We use uh, VEPFIT and VEPFIT gives us this plotting results and this fitting results, sorry, and this fitting gives us the, um, yes, you can see it as a, uh, a, a, a the behavior of the positrons in the material. We can do that also by for the W parameter, and then we see the same changes, uh, but then uh, a little bit different from the other. Here we have a plot with the W parameter and a VEPFIT result on it. Interesting is when we plot the S and W parameter in one plot. First of all, all pristine results are here, and uh, uh, this is uh, the, the, the cycling of, of 1000, and this is the cycling of 3000. You have to understand that we are looking in depth in this. So this is the depth. So this is low energy, and this is high energy of the positrons, but for uh, more analyzing results, because we want to compare all results with each other for different cycling um, uh, situations, we define these red points, and these red points are, uh, um, we, we, we found these red points by VEPFIT, and I, and I show you how. Here you see these uh, S plot and W plot uh, from before. And you see here the VEPFIT result of S1 is this one, S1, and W1 is here, and that gives this point in this SW plot. And we can do that for all kinds of measurements, and that makes us, that gives us one point 
for every measurement. So that means for every single measurement we define one point. And that makes it possible to compare uh, all kinds of measurements with each other. So we can charge discharge uh, samples with different charge rates and we can compare them by using these red points. That is the bulk S and W from this material. So we take out the depth information out of this plot. The SW plot I show you now is the next one. This is without depth information. So every point in this plot is a bulk S and W of the material. And that makes it very interesting because this is a plot you see here the pristine material again and um, when we charge these samples we started with charging for 50 milliamps per gram and we go up to 2000 milliamps per gram and then you see that we can draw, draw a line between this and in positron terms everything every pro every point on a certain line in a ws plot is from the same process is from the same process and that means there is a kind of different process coming up here you see that there is a, another line here when we go to 4, 1450 and 2000 there is another process coming up and when we uh, yeah, I want to show you that graphically I can see that you can see that here I uh, we think that this process this line this process is the is, has to do with the structural changes that caused that is caused by lithiation of silicon. So, for instance, am, am amorphization. Uh, that is a process that is ha that is happening in uh, silicon when you lithiate it. So that is a normal process, and that is not a defect process. But this one, uh, the, the the second one, that is probably the formation of defects, and that. If we compare that with other data we have done with cycling data from 1000 and 2000 and 3000 milliampers per gram, we see that there is uh, a deformation of material in this area to 2000, 3000 are deformed. And so that means that this, um, well, combining these results gives us the idea that we are looking at a, uh, a new process here. That brings me to the conclusions of this study. I think we showed you that AFM and PULSE is a powerful combination for research on silicon anodes. And probably also on other battery, battery materials, but silicon anodes gives us very nice results till now. And this PULSE uh, measurement, the positron annihilation uh, techniques, uh, we uh, we think we can see uh, we can distinguish the structural changes of the material from defect formation and that is a very interesting result because that is um, for future uh, if, uh, for future research we can use that um, uh, positron annihilation technique to see on uh, which way we can charge or discharge until uh, the material breaks down and uh, this information we go further with this research of course and I'm very glad that I uh, had the opportunity to uh, to present you these uh, results on this way I want to thank people I want to thank the Imagi uh, company for uh, making uh, the porous silicon uh, available for this research and I want to thank uh, Chitta Nord, my student, for his essential and indispensable contribution to the pulse measurements. And uh, for you, uh, I hope you're doing well in this uh, strange situation, this COVID situation. Hopefully we can meet each other uh, uh, later in this year or uh, in the future uh, when this COVID situation is under control. But uh, well, we will see. Thank you very much for your attention.